Lord Almighty, it's episode 10 of Decently Indecent. That's double-digit territory, and what better way to celebrate than to talk about the sweet nectar of procreative fortitude? Is it okay to come on a woman's day? It's just me again in this one, and I had a great time chatting about sex coaches, the vigilante pedo-hunting kick community, that dickhead Vitaly, and, you know, we ended with a little boomer wisdom as I responded to some questions that came from you guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you find something valuable. Let's get into it. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Decently Indecent Podcast, episode 10. That is right. We are in double digits now, officially, of episode number, and I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, before we get into it, honestly, before we jump in, speaking of uh, indecent, I have a little little ditty I want to play for you. Those of you watching can see this, and if you're listening, you'll, you'll be able to hear it. Just, this was on my... my, my uh, it was on my my FYP today, not my fault, whatever, the recommended homepage of YouTube. Is it okay to come on a woman's face? I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, what was it? I didn't, I didn't start from the beginning, I apologize. Is it okay to come on a woman's face? So this video, <laughs> I don't, you know how the YouTube recommended works, man. Like, it's kind of a reflection of what you watch, but occasionally like a rogue video sneaks in there. And I know I'm going to get shit like, oh, yeah, and why, you know, but, then, you know, randomly, like when something's a little bit uh, divisive or inflammatory or overtly sexual, those tend to find their way around YouTube just because of the nature of, uh, you know, clickability, et cetera. Woman's face in the thumbnail video titled how to ask for sexual favors in parentheses like <laughs> coming on her face. And I'm like, brother, I'm just... I'm just signing on to YouTube to try and watch a golf video. You know, most of my recommended sidebars like League of Legends videos and golf these days because just a little indication of what, you know, I'm usually getting fed based on my interests. Uh, and this pops up on the top eight and I'm like, oh. So I clicked it. This is while I'm just, I'm jotting down a few things I was going to, I was going to talk about tonight. But uh, <laughs> I I haven't even watched it. I just figured, what you know, what, what the hell? It's episode. We're double digits. It's episode ten. We're in double digit episode territory. We're gonna we're gonna consult the sex coach Stephanie Ganowski. Twenty six k subs. Sex self proclaimed sex coaches too. Just in general, are very interesting to me. Like that's your profession. Hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a sex coach. All right. I, that's that's weird. I, it's probably not weird. It may, I was just raised, you know, religious, so maybe it just feels a little weird as an as uh, an adult. That's kind of some of that stuff uh, still sticks with me to this day. Maybe it's not weird. I don't know. You guys tell me. Before we do that, though, uh, huge shout out, huge shout out to Zach Shut, who, if you're watching, he uh, he sent me a little care package. As you can see, I got the Meta PCs hat on. He was on uh, an episode a few weeks ago, had a great conversation with him, and he sent me this bottle of Suavecito Extra Anejo um, tequila. Very smooth. I've already had a glass. I got a fresh ice ball here. I'm going to pour up another one. And let me tell you what, there's actually a question I was going to answer later on in this episode about what my favorite spirit is because <clears throat> I, I had a little, I did a little community post on YouTube. Um, and that was one of the questions, what's your favorite drink or liquor? And, uh, well, we're just going to answer that one right off the bat. It's tequila. And they also asked why. And I, you know what? I don't, I think flavor. I don't, it's like, it's like everything I love about whiskey with the aged. Well, if you drink, you know, Reposados or Añejos with the aged, um, with the aged barrel treatment, you know, I believe in Añejo is uh, a year plus aged in oak, uh, excuse me, two years plus probably. I don't know the specifics, but, uh, just incredible flavors notes. Uh, but with that tequila sweetness and that tequila base, it's, it, it's, it often feels so much less harsh than bourbon or whiskey to me as much as I do love those. Um, there's quite frankly, not a spirit that I don't like, um, but if I'm just sipping, like I'm sipping now, it's probably gonna be, it's probably gonna be tequila or a little bit of bourbon whiskey. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so pumped to have you guys here. Uh, listen, this is the deal. Sorry, first sip's always the tastiest, and by first I mean first of the new glass. Uh, I was supposed to have Josh the Snake on this week. Many of you know Josh the Snake. Um, but for those of you who don't, he is a good friend of mine. He's an ex-employee. He's one of the first, em uh, employees I ever had who went on to 
greener pastures to work for Mr. Beast. And he's now been one of the editing team leads for Mr. Beast for for years and years. So uh, I was going to have him on this week, but he sent me a video. <laughs> fucking dumbass. I should pull it up. Hold on. Of him absolutely ruining his ankle. Sent me a video of him just he, uh, trying to do a razor scooter trick in the warehouse uh, at the Mr. one of Mr. Beast's 367 warehouses that he owns in North Carolina, I think. I will. Uh, I don't, he's like, bro, can we reschedule? I was out of work. I had to go get x rays. And uh, you're obviously not going to be able to see this if you're, here we go. You're not going to be able to see this if you're watching, but he's, he's like jumping a razor scooter off probably like a three or four foot ledge. And his foot fl flips off and just cooks it. So he's all, uh, he's all banged up. So I'm pumped to talk to him. He's going to be on hopefully next week. Uh, but right now, we're trying to figure out <coughs> how to <laughs> how to ask for sexual favors. Let's get back to this video that was on my recommended, uh, just completely unrelated. Again, I haven't watched past the first eight seconds, so we're going to experience this together. Uh, it's just talking head, so if you're listening, you'll be able to follow right along here. Hey guys, I'm Stephanie Ganowski, sexologist and sex coach for men. And in this video, we are talking about doing the dirty on her face. I get this question. Why is it going to be the dirty? You know what I'm saying? Come on. This, this is so like YouTube's so classic because, you know, I can't, uh, you can't monetize anything overtly sexual unless, unless you're a coach. Oh, if you're a coach, then all right, you can just talk about nothing all over somebody's face. Doesn't even matter. Listen, I told you this show is going to be indecent sometimes, okay? Or anyone listening, I know my folks listen to this sometimes. This is just how things go from time to time. It's not all wholesome, philosophical, well, what books do you read? Sometimes we're talking about not on people's faces. It's just the way life is. Let's keep it going. So often, is it okay to come on her face? It really depends on the woman. There are women who absolutely <laughs> love it majority of the time. There are women who, need, within a certain context, they really want it. There are also women who are like, eh, not really a huge fan, but I'll, do, I'll let you. Okay, so while she's talking on the screen for the video, she has like rolling text in the bottom, in the bottom that's coming up, and in, in this, it says at the bottom, some women, some women will treat it like a gift. I mean that. <laughs> okay. We we really do live in a pornography addicted culture, don't we? You do it for your birthday. And then there's the woman who's like, no, never. Then there's also the woman never. who's like, I've never gone there and I don't think I ever want to go there. Or but... I've never gone there and I'm never going there. So, so it varies. And the thing I also find interesting is that guys believe there's no... You see, that's crazy because if the internet is any teacher for most of these young men growing up just pounding hours of porn every week every girl loves it i don't know what i don't know what she's talking about i, I it's, that seems crazy that they're i oh, i'm kidding of course we just i have a i have a very bleak outlook on young men relationships in general the level of uh, pornography addiction worldwide everything is just very bleak when it comes to what i i i mean I, I guess she's insinuating that these are all just normal questions and part of healthy relationships. Certainly it could be. Yeah. Way she can get turned on to this. There's no way she can actually like mm. it, right? Like she's definitely doing it for me at the end of the day. There's nothing in it for her. It's kind of gross. I feel bad. And you use this terminology based on how you perceive it. I feel powerful. It's not true. It's how you perceive it, right? So you want to make sure that if you're asking your woman if you can on her face just if you're gonna make the video just stop pussyfooting around the word unless you're she's probably trying to stay monetized which she probably is because she's an educator i'm educating can i just be a fucking can i be a teacher can i just call myself an educator and still monetize lewd jokes i think i fucked that up and i should have really just approached that loophole from a whole different angle maybe too late in the game now but uh She's like she's like self uh, she's like self ducking her audio on her voice every time the word come comes up. She's like, if you want to ask, if if you know, you can come on her face. And you know, it's just, some girls are into it. You know, it's it could be a gift. And if you want to come, <clears throat> and so if you really want to come, come on, come on, her, 
Just say it's it. the first time. Like it's never happened. You never talked to her about this. You never asked it. You're not sure what she'll think. Don't go into it saying, hey, I know this is a horrible question and this is really gross. I hate to ask this. No, don't paint it bad before you deliver the question. You got to hype that shit up. Like, honey, listen, I know Like, I, I heard about this crazy thing. It exfoliates. It's empowering. <laughs> From what I've actually read on the whatever podcast, I saw a whatever podcast short on YouTube and apparently girls really love it. Like it makes them feel very empowered. I think it's actually kind of like feminist, honestly, to uh, let me come, come on your face. So I'm sorry. I want this. No sorries. Don't apologize. Don't act like it's a bad thing because it's be a not. man if you're coming across that way you're going to make her question it if she's not even questioning it maybe she'd be down to do it but because you start the conversation with i'm really sorry i have to ask you this or i'm, and I'm sorry i want this don't give her an inch that's what i'm saying that's what she's trying to get at you give her an inch she'll take that country mile but you come in hard and fast and on her face I mean, no, no, sorry. We were talking about the conversation. I'm all confused. Let's keep it going. Don't do that. There's no need because that's your own judgment. The act of coming on her face is just <laughs> simply that. It's just coming on her face. So There it was. So she finally said it. Like she she ducked it again for like the fifth time and then said it. Oh, the simply that. It's just coming on her face. There it is. So see how the way you initiate conversations about things you're you're unsure about because you feel awkward or you feel shame around it, I encourage you to work on that. If there's something you're uncomfortable with and you want your partner to play a part in it and you want to have a conversation, try your best to go in confidently. Mm -hmm. Try your best to be like, hey, I really have been thinking about this a lot. Um, and yeah, but I've watched hundreds of thousands of hours of porn. It's like my it's kind of like a fetish now. So um, <laughs> this is so it's so interesting. <clears throat> I could just be a boomer. I'm fully, I'm fully okay and aware of that, that like, maybe this is just normal. Uh, I get, you know, I'm not trying to approach this from the perspective, like, Ooh, she said, come or she should said sex. Tee hee. But like, it is just a little strange to watch this, like woman who's probably a self-proclaimed clinician. I don't even, I have no idea if she has credentials or if she's just like, I don't even know if you need credentials to be a sex coach. You can probably just be like, Hey, I'm a sex coach for men <laughs> and I'm, I'm reasonably conventionally attractive in bingo bango. You have a fucking career on YouTube. So, uh, but it's a little stranger here talking. So, uh, you know, seriously about, about it. In a way that's, I don't know, maybe I was just raised in locker room, so it's hard to take and it seriously. I was hoping you could play a part in it. What are your thoughts? And just cut it there. What are your thoughts? Then you wait for a reaction and a response. And if the response... Then you get slapped in the face and you know what? It was worth a shot. I'm just kidding. I know I I say these things as if no, you know, no woman would ever be interested in this, but uh, you know, what do I know? is oh man that's ugh, that's kind of weird to me that makes me uncomfortable not sure about that then you read her and you say something like all right like any way we can meet in the middle with it like how about this would you be comfortable with this it's meeting in the middle somewhere this is <laughs> just the rolling text at the bottom said meeting in the middle coming on her stomach <laughs> oh man I that's actually factually wrong. The middle would technically be coming on her tits, I would think. You know, if we're talking geographically from the face to, you know, stomach's kind of like meeting in Texas, you know? That's more that's like meeting somewhere down south, like Tennessee or Georgia. Like if we're meeting in the middle, that's definitely on the tits. This is semantics, though. Don't let me get going. Let's just let her finish. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. Active. There are women, like I said, who truly, truly enjoy it because sometimes when you're really turned on, I mean, almost every time when you're really turned on, your disgust response goes down. So mm. as long as she's <laughs> turned on and you've had play before this, like a lot of foreplay and making her feel sexy and her being in her sexy zone and you guys having a lot of touch and connection, then by the time you ejaculate, she will be much more likely to enjoy things like that because disgust response goes down. She's feeling extra connected with you. She's feeling special. She's feeling really 
The disgust response. That's an interesting scale I've never heard of. Like, hey, honey, uh, how are you doing on the disgust response scale? Where are we at, like a seven or an eight? Or are we at like meeting in the middle? Or are we going to be like a Texas type of deal right now? Oh, a three? So shall I bring it up again? Or what do we do? <laughs> the disgust response scale. I had heard that. That's fantastic. Just want to gauge this one out, sweetheart. Uh, on your disgust response scale, I know earlier this afternoon I took a fat shit with the door wide open while you were home and it sunk the place up for like, oh God, at least three or four hours. But that was mid-afternoon. It's now nine or 10 o'clock. Where are we at on the disgust response scale? Is it, uh, we below a five? What are we talking about? <laughs> we talking about here she's sexy maybe she's feeling dirty or erotic and she's in that <clears throat> space to want that even women who aren't like or maybe you have a woman that is turned on by the fat shit you took earlier in the afternoon i don't you know what i just don't know right away super into it those who get really built up on an arousal level are more likely to want it as long as they're built up. But there are also women who no matter how aroused they are, they don't want it. And that's totally fine. Everybody is different, right? And sometimes you just can't get your partner to sway their decision and you shouldn't, right? You shouldn't have to make them. They should want to get to that point. But I do still believe it's important for you to share with your partner um, what you'd be interested in and ask if they'd be willing to do it. You want to at least share behind. about yourself, put out the ask, and then your partner knows. So maybe <laughs> in the future, if they're like, okay with it, and you guys are in a really good place, it's likely to happen. Yeah, I mean, the honey, listen, you just got to approach her when she's at an appropriate disgust response. You know, you got to really, as a man, you know, you're going to go in firm with confidence, but you have to be able to read the, the disgust response. That's very, it's very important. If your partner is not comfortable with that thing, try to meet in the middle. Don't let the no mean <clears throat> that there's something wrong with your ejaculate. Don't make it personal. Make it about, okay, this person's uncomfortable about this act. Maybe we Wait, could talk a little say? bit Don't about it. Know try some... to meet in the middle. Don't let it happen. If your partner is not comfortable with that Don't thing, them... try to meet in the middle. Don't let the no mean that there's something wrong with your ejaculate. Don't make... Well, I mean, are you insinuating that there is something wrong with my ejaculate? You're like, don't let them know there's something wrong with your ejaculate. Don't let them know it's absolutely filthy and disgusting. And maybe they like that. But just see where they're doing on the disgust response scale. Make it personal. Make it about, okay, this person's uncomfortable about this act. Maybe we could talk a little bit about it. Or maybe we're talked out and it's just something that they're red light, you know, not going to happen ever. There are plenty of other things to do and try. I hope this video was helpful. I will see you in the next one. Yeah. All right. So thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, super enlightening. <laughs> oh man. I don't like my, my recommended is going to be cooked now. You guys probably can imagine over the years I've been making YouTube videos, you know, I've done stuff on sexually themed genres on YouTube, how like the chiropractors will, uh, use Instagram only fans models. They'll like have them come in, give them a free session. And then they'll just so they can get like a thumbnail of their like ass cheeks and camel toe hanging out. Like everything on YouTube, like everything you didn't think could be sexualized has been sexualized in order to make a good clickable YouTube thumbnail. Chiropractory, house cleaning. Uh, what was the one I did recently? Camping, outdoorsy, overnight camping. Um, really incredible. So this at least isn't beating around the bush. Like she's just straight up like, Hey, here's my face in the thumbnail. Let's talk about asking your woman to come on her face. So you know what? She's a, Oh, the first, the disclaimer too, in the description, this video is made for educational purposes only. Hallelujah. It'll help you understand why it's important to not ask from a place of insecurity and how some things that maybe seem one-sided are actually not at all. Go in there confident. I mean, that's true with anything in life. You got to go in confident. You want to go in and talk to your boss about getting a raise? You don't go in and be like, hey, yeah, I know like my performance this quarter hasn't been that good and I was late four or five times and my wife's expecting, so I've been a little distracted at work, but well, do you think I can get that 10% raise? No, you walk in there with your dick in your hand, pants off, you lay your entire sack and fucking meat and potatoes on the desk and you say, give me that 10% raise, bitch, or I'm walking, right? And it's the same exact technique 
with trying to reduce your woman's disgust response scale. You walk in there, maybe keep the dick in the pants for this one and, and feel it out. But uh, <laughs> what a while. I mean, some of the stuff, oh, the, the, the sidebar now too. How to Hire an Escort by Caitlin V. I am just on a side of YouTube I didn't want to be on. Oh, I actually, the, what, the, earlier on when I, I clicked on this to like save the link for this, I this short recommendation came up uh, on my sidebar. Oh, you know, like uh, called, during football season? I'm the BJ ref. And it's this woman wearing like a referee jersey with a whistle. And I was like, all right, I, I kind of have to click on that. And what, of course I have to. 19,000 views nine months ago. Fucking YouTube algorithm at work again. Here we are. I don't have like a favorite team I'm supposed to, but I don't even really get what's going on. Don't even care to get what's going on. So, football games, I wear the ref outfit because I'm the fucking ref. This is. I am the boss of all the shit. I all right, this is a immeasurable crackhead energy right here. If you can't see this, like low cut low cut v-neck ref jersey she's just hold, she's inside just holding a lighter in her hand like she just she just absolutely tore up the crack pipe and didn't even have you know didn't even have the presence of mind to just put the lighter down before she made this I'm short in control love this i say if you win or lose so have to be nice to the fucking ref so yeah this is what i wear if you want to know if you want to know what kind of ref i am i'm bj ref at that joint fucking so I don't really know okay I don't oh know who that ref is but I do know there is a f I was kind of kidding at first about the crack, crackhead energy but I'm pretty sure she's banged up on fucking right BJ now. ref and if I was gonna be any fucking ref of course I'd be a fucking BJ ref BJ ref BJ ref B pull over that ass it's too fat yes yes oh no Play with your balls you know what they say I'm a BJ ref she's still hold Flag on the penalty. Still holding the it's letter. No fucking good. No good. I can't. <laughs> Ball in the hole or field goal. I am in the, the wrong letters. side of YouTube. Get me out. Lord Almighty, I have sinned. Will not, cannot, shall not. I'm the fucking ref and I said no. No, 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 no. Favorite word is no. All right. That, that's enough of that. What am I doing? I li I all started with that woman on my on my homepage, and I apologize, but I'm also not sorry at all that I brought you guys along for that ride. Um, we're done talking about BJ refs. We're done talking about asking your woman about her disgust response scale and whether or not you can come <clears throat> on her face. Uh, I wanted to briefly transition here uh, into a woman. No, fuck. No, that's not what I want. That's nope. No, I wanted to transition into um, <laughs> talking about a young woman. No, oh, fuck. No, not that either. What am I trying to say? I want to transition into talking about a situation involving a young woman and an old man and a couple of YouTubers you might know. This week, if you guys, I'm sure many of you listening or watching, if you spend time online like I do, you saw that... Uh, like the Vitaly TV and Bradley Martin pedo hunter collab. Now, a lot of layers of the onion to peel back here, first of all. Um, the first one is like, why the fuck is Vitaly TV making a comeback? Okay. Um, I don't know. If you don't know who Vitaly is, he's one of the OG. He's like the OG prankster. The OG of OG pranksters, uh, early YouTube days, kind of like Fousey Tube era. Um, basically a dickhead, just a just a real dickhead. Uh, he's he made quite a name for himself. His YouTube channel has, I mean, fuck, ten million subscribers. It was dead for a long time, but I mean, he's done everything from like I think he was like d directing porn for a minute and just every just. No stone was left unturned in his pursuit for, you know, clicks and revenue and, and, and notoriety, whatever it is. And is as that goes, this and like same with FouseyTube, like these guys, they make millions and millions of dollars. And then they're just so they're just so tapped that they they have a way of essentially crashing and burning and losing it all. 
And from, from what I understand, he was in a tough spot, mainly because I one of the reasons why he's a piece of shit, you guys probably know, like several years ago now, is it four or five years ago, he uh, got arrested for randomly assaulting a female jogger. And I, I never looked into like how that case resolved or why that even was, why it even happened. And I mean, there's pictures if you look at look at pictures of this chick, this was this was years ago, but she got banged up hard. And I guess the story is in in the weirdest the the way I learned about this story today and looking it up, I'm like, why did he end up doing that? I got taken to a R slash shrooms subreddit because it was like people that are trying to do shrooms that were like, I heard Vitaly was tripping really bad and he like beat the shit out of this random female stranger. I want to make sure that doesn't happen to me. I'm like, what the so the story is that like he was just fucked up on drugs, basically. I don't think shrooms would make you do this, but what do I know? Maybe it was bath salts and he just randomly this woman was jogging all but just jogging by herself and he and he I don't know if they had an interaction beforehand, just beat the piss out of her. And and of course, that was huge news at the time. He gets arrested. So like I don't know how much money the settlement was or whatever it was, but he ended up apparently um, like he was facing deportation because he's not uh, a U.S. citizen from what I understand, natural born, obviously. Um, but eventually I learned this on the Roman Atwood podcast when he was on, I don't know, like a year ago or something like that. They He settled with this woman out of court. They, their lawyers reached a settlement. Uh, I don't think he's ever talked about how much it was, but all the charges were dropped. So I don't know if that's how he like, lost all of his money or whatever. Um, but all that's to say that he is now back with a kick deal. I think Steve will do it somehow. Uh, had something to do with it. Steve obviously being on kick or not. I think he posts most of his videos on X, but he probably gambles on kick and shit. I don't know. I'll, kick is a interesting, is an interesting place, man. It's like <clears throat> all of the, the dejected degenerates that have been, left behind by other platforms where they're not allowed. I'll, I'll seem to culminate on kick. And, you know, I understand there is an element of entertainment to these dudes and what they do, but a lot of these guys like Vitaly, just in my opinion, are just real pieces of shit. People I wouldn't want to associate with. So now his new thing is he's like a pedo hunter and he does these episodes. And of course, like pedo hunting is like, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it's been around forever. Chris Hansen, How to Catch a Predator. It's it's an interesting form of entertainment because it feels like vigilante vigilante justice. It's cheap in the sense that everyone can get behind trying to wreck a pedo, right? Like, you know, uh, someone who's legitimately trying to meet up with a really, like a child in in a sexual way, like... I'm of the mindset that like, yeah, just throw them in the wood chipper. Sure. But on the flip side of that, it's like Vitaly, I'm not sure that he gives a single shit about whether there is or is not a pedo involved or if he's trying to take one off the street. He only has one singular goal of getting views and making money. So like, and he's just like a master of doing every, like every single vertical and genre of content that can... Uh, that can best manipulate people's emotions and like being the next pedo hunter is like, that's his thing and it's working. And he recently had Bradley Martin <clears throat> who I like Bradley Martin in, in many respects. I respect him as a, 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 biz, a content creator. I've, I've heard some interesting things from him, but uh, he's built quite an empire for himself. He's a huge you know, fitness guy, all juice, juice to the gills, absolutely jacked out of his tits. But, uh, but you know, he's been very involved in the podcast scene with the Nelk boys and he's made quite a name for himself. He owns rock He has a gym out in LA, blah, blah, blah. But I enjoy some of the stuff he says. And it, I've watched some of his podcasts. And when he was on the Nelk boys podcast, sometimes I thought it was, I thought he was more insightful than like Steiny or just a lot of the Nelk guys that don't really offer much besides being like a shide show like Steiny. Actually, Kyle's okay, but 
Uh, anyways, the most insightful and I thought asked the best questions. I thought he was definitely the best host on that. And he does a pretty good job on his podcast as well. That's to say he linked up with Vitaly. They did an episode recently of the Pedo Hunter, which I believe is live streamed on kick. Went super viral uh, when it dropped on Twitter this week because apparently I'm reading a tweet here. This is just one of the 500,000 accounts that reposted the video. This is some stupid media account. It says, hold on to your seat, folks. Hollywood screenwriter Herschel Weingrod, the mastermind behind box office hits like Space Jam, Trading Places, Twins, and Kindergarten Cop, has been caught meeting up with a 15-year-old. In an epic bust, Vitaly and Bradley Martin captured Weingrod, who was going by the name Boris quote unquote, trying to get away after claiming he was just flirting with the minor. But that's not all. Vitaly wasn't about to let him get away that easily. He whipped out two powder cannons and covered Weingrod right on the spot. Talk about dramatic takedown. First of all, that caption makes me have AIDS. I hate that caption. Shut the fuck up. We're going to watch this video. I haven't actually watched. It's three minutes long. Again, you're going to be able to listen along if you're listening. Um, but Bradley Martin is, it starts with Bradley Martin leaning on this table at like what looks like an outside patio restaurant booth. And if you don't know who Bradley is, this is a large motherfucking man. He's like 6'3", 250, arms the size of my head, yoked to the tits. And this old producer, apparently a famous Hollywood guy, which big surprise, a pedo in Hollywood. No one saw that coming. <laughs> is sitting with this, uh, you know, what is alleged uh, a 15-year-old girl that apparently they had, you know, played a part in setting up. And I don't know if her, you know, I don't know if her actual age is 15. I know back in the Chris Hansen days when they were setting up these stings, I believe they were using adults that were 18 plus that were obviously just uh, acting as minors, et cetera. So I don't know what, what, this, what the case is for them, but anyways. Oh, fuck. What's your name? Who are you? What's your name? Who are you? Why are you suing my fucking daughter? What's your name? What is your name? Boris. My name is Boris. What's Boris. What, what's your name? Shake my hand. What's the problem? Why are you suing my... What? <laughs> a very weird of Bradley to be like, he came in super hot and aggressive. What's your name? But then like, shake my hand. Like, why, dude? Like, shaking someone's hand is like a formal greeting of like someone you're interested in meeting i'm not i think bradley's probably just as flustered his heart's probably racing right now i don't really see him as this guy that like does this kind of like dog the pedo hunter shit but you know and he's he's got that brain that's like oh this is probably gonna get a lot of views or maybe he just genuinely feels like he's doing something ethical and good by trying to help us pedos and that, like that's the thing like i don't if they genuinely caught this dude if, you know if it it's maybe a net positive <clears throat> But I still fucking hate Vitaly, and so I'm I'm very morally conflicted about the whole thing, and I've always felt that way about pedo hunters in general. It's like I never am gonna get mad about seeing a fucking disgusting piece of shit get exposed live, but I do question the intentions of the people involved. Daughter, you know how old she is? I don't. I have no idea. You have no idea. I have no idea. You have no idea. No. What the fuck you thought was gonna happen here? Nothing. I. We're gonna have a pizza. I don't know. Pizza? Yeah, you don't know. What? How old is she? Red. I met. You know how old she is? I matched with her. She was twenty-three. On twenty-three. Is that, is that what that the conversation looked like? You know what the text messages? She was twenty-three on a 23. dating site. On a dating, on a dating, dating site. site. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She was twenty-three. On how old Cheers. is she? I have no idea. Lila, how old are you? I'm sorry. She was twenty-three on a dating site. All we've done is so talk. she didn't tell you. She didn't tell you how old she was. She did. She did. Yeah. How old is she? She said she was fifteen. How did she oh, okay. So it said twenty three on the dating site, but then she told you she was fifteen, and that's fine. So this old motherfucker's like shaking, as he should be. Said she was fifteen. The man's seventy two, and you're gonna meet up for pizza? Like what the fuck? Did she tell you how old she actually is? She said she's fifteen. 15. She said she's fifteen. Why? Yeah. Why are you here? Why are you sitting here? I'm just. Having a with a fucking fifteen year old? Having a pizza. Piece of pizza with a fucking fifteen year old. It's not against You think the that's law. okay? It's not against the law. It's not against the law. No. Is that all you spoke about to her? So you know, legally, of course, no, that's not against the law. But 
typically where the old school how to catch predator shit, it's always about the chat logs, like which I imagine they're obviously part of the setup too. So if you have logs where there's intent <clears throat> for things to get overtly sexual, then then yeah, you're cooked. We've just been talking. And really? Yeah, we've been talking and flirting. It's not a big deal. Where are you going? Oh, yeah, I'm 72. I'm just flirting with a 15-year-old online. Not a big deal. I'm going to take off. Flirt a piece, I'm going to go. Okay, have a seat. <laughs> have a seat. Why? I'll sit with you. I'll eat pizza with you. We're just having pizza, right? Sorry. Sit right here. Sorry. Sit right here. Sorry. Where? I don't know. Whoa, excuse said, me, sir. Excuse me. You said you wanted a kiss, touch, and lick, whatever? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so dude's leaving. <clears throat> He's walking away. Bradley was trying to get in his way and stop him. I don't think they can legally detain him and i don't know like you know with with the chris hansen shit it's like they had the cops ready to go you know and in this one it's like what you just vitaly's thing is he just shoots him with a with a glitter cannon or something like uh it's just weird i don't understand what people so you're a face. pedophile trying to meet a 15 year old oh right. shit shoots i'm sorry it's the, not a boy a glitter it's cannon. a girl whoa <laughs> yeah you are Wait. You hear audio. You hear audio. So they're all just walking down the sidewalk and they're following him as he's trying to make his escape. Look at this guy. Look. Very bizarre. Clown. Hi. Right. Where's he go? Where's he go? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna say. So this guy, this guy's just walking around. He's covered in blue and pink. I don't know, like like the whatever powder you would use for a gender reveal party. You know, he's just covered in like blue and pink fucking dust. Like flustered, just trying to get the fuck out of there. Just this guy knows his. I mean, he's probably already retired. You know what I mean? But now he's his reputation. He's completely fucking cooked. This is the man who directed Space Jam. The old Jewish Hollywood director. Probably been a kindergarten cop too. Twins. Some of the best movies of all time, if you're of the age that I am. I'm, you know, creeping on 39, and those are all 90s bangers. Trading Places, too, another banger. Unfucking believable. Like, there's just no, there's just no end to the degeneracy and evil that lives within people and what like what is it about hollywood you know what i mean is it just these high profile rich motherfuckers think there's no repercussions like what what is going on you know i know that's such a it's such a rabbit hole of conspiracy right any anyone you talk or if you go online or you go on x or twitter god bless like you know you can go down that rabbit hole for days about how hollywood is just one big cover for like you know, a global pedophile ring. And I'm, I am a little bit averse to just jumping into believing any sort of, uh, you know, any, any, any particular, just, just cons what you would call conspiracy in general. But over the years, specifically in the last like four, five, six years, I'm more willing to give it a nod, you know, like there was years ago, like a decade ago where I was like, uh, some people are just crazy and this conspiracy is nuts. And that is still true. There are people that are just nuts and will come up with a conspiracy over everything. But I feel like the last decade has kind of shown us that like, you know what? Conspiracy is also a word used to discredit people that might actually be onto something. So it's like you have to be very careful not to just throw away everything that sounds crazy because it might be true. And not for nothing, but like look at the last half a decade, Jeffrey Epstein, the, like uh, Corey Feldman, a uh, child actor, legendary child actor was one of the, the characters in Goonies, one of the best movies of all time that came out the year I was born. He's been trying to blow the whistle on, you know, pedo Hollywood forever. So like there's been, there's been too many, uh, there's been too many things that have happened in my opinion for there, for us to just be like, oh, there's not a problem in Hollywood. Like at this point, it seems like there is clearly something going on. I don't know what the fuck it is. What about like, this was, this was this year, this, the, the Nickelodeon <clears throat> allegations 
for uh, Dan Schneider, right? He was kind of like the kid, the Nickelodeon kid show puppet master, built an empire uh, on shows like Drake and Jaw, I think. I forget the exact shows, but uh, oh yeah, they released a documentary, like all these people that were like part of these, all these child stars that were part of these kids TV uh, series you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago or all like, yeah, this place was crazy. And Dan Snyder himself, who was kind of like one of the big fish in charge of all of this shit. I don't think he specifically get charged for like pew allegations, but it was like abusive behavior, sexism, like just all types of misconduct. And not only that, but he also had three people that he allowed to work either for him or on the shows he was working on that all had a history of sexual deviancy at, or what would you call it? Like um, people that were basically had already had been accused of some sort of uh, sexual predation on minors. And they were working and on set in a place that was filming kids shows. So like complete negligence there. All of it. Uh, the the P Diddy shit that's been going on. I don't know that that like the P Diddy shit that's been less. I feel like about pedo stuff and more like oh well, I you know I don't know I didn't look too far into it but that seemed more like kind of sexual blackmail around different rappers. Uh, but there's just no there's no limit to the amount of evil that permeates. The higher, you know, what we would consider the higher echelons of society, the rich, the famous, uh, you know, <clears throat> the people that have gotten to a, a social status where you know, it's interesting because like <sighs> these are these are the type of people that don't have normal people problems, right? Like they've they ascended long a long time ago above, you know, the normal people problems of like needing to pay bills and figuring out what your job is going to be. It's like, and it's almost like you lose after a long enough time, you lose the human part of you. And I don't know if it's like a God complex or what it is, but people are just, are just evil. And I say like, I'm throwing the, I'm throwing the word evil around. Like I'm some sort of like preacher, or, like I'm trying to like give a sermon right now, but like, I don't even, you know, I don't even necessarily. Uh, yeah. I get like metaphorically, I believe in good and evil. I don't know that it's necessarily demons and angels and God and Satan, you know, that's, it's a whole nother discussion, but certainly when you look at some of the shit, it's hard not to believe, or you could just believe biologically we've evolved to a place where humans are innately bad and despicable and any sort of civility in good that lives within us. But what you might consider good is just a beautiful byproduct of evolution that has been able to prosper in some people, but certainly has been left behind in others. It's fucking crazy, man. Josh Peck, that was a big thing. You know, Josh Peck from Jake and Josh, he was one of the guys from like Dan Snyder. He was apparently molested by one of the guys that Dan Snyder was employing to be on the set. And Josh Peck, then he was a big part of like the David Dobrik crew. And he recently, I don't know how, I don't, it might not have been that recent, but came out with his whole story and that thing. So it's like every other day, it's like just this, this story about someone who was abused and taken advantage of when they were younger. And it always seems to be in the entertainment industry, Macaulay Culkin and not even, yeah, I do. It, it never ends. So fucking, I don't know. Another banger home alone. What would I do without home alone? It's so funny. Like these movies, they're like a lot of these shows and these movies with these child, like they're, they're made to make people feel good and to make people laugh. And it's like decades later, you find out what was going on behind the scenes during the making of these, 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 these pieces of media that you hold so dear and it like sullies it. It taints it a little bit, you know, ribbit, excuse me. 
Cheers. Uh, this is this anejo is actually absolutely delightful, delicious. So, anyways, where did I? I just went on a Hollywood tangent, but that all is to circle back around to the tally TV. Um, you know, mixed feelings. Uh, I guess I just found this out too, but apparently Vitaly is also sober now, three years. So that's definitely a a bonus. I'm never gonna. Oh, this is an Instagram is just a post he made before I spread all the Nutella on the booty tonight. I can't believe Two I made it to ago. 32. Thank you guys for all your birthday wishes. And just know, without you, I wouldn't be shit. It's your life, your choice. Let's eat. Uh, all right. So, yeah, he turned 32. It's his birthday, and it marks his three-year anniversary of being sober. Um, so, never going to talk down on someone for making that decision, especially, I mean, I don't think he really had a choice if you're fucking beating the absolute shit out of random female joggers. Uh, yeah, you kind of got to pull the trigger on some change there, partner. So good for him in that respect. Still don't trust him. Still don't like him. Still think that everything he does is self-serving and the sort of facade he's putting on to try and pretend like he's trying to clean up the streets is, is strictly for the sake of trying to make a living, um, which is whatever. But if the net, you know, net, net, if it's like, hey, this fucking legendary Hollywood director who directed Space Jam gets out at his pedo and his life is ruined. I guess that's I guess that's better than nothing. So mixed emotions, but yeah, just throw, you know what? Fuck it, throw them in the wood chipper. I wish there was a follow up. Like, do do these guys get arrested? Are you allowed to call the cops on these guys? Do you have? That's the fucking problem with modern day like independent vigilante justice you know modern day youtube pedo hunter type shit is like there's no th like nothing's thorough do we get to find out what happens like do you have evidence do you have chat logs is there a follow-up it's all just like oh yeah fuck that stream did fuck that stream bang these clips went viral on to the next one <laughs> like come on bro it, can we throw this guy in the wood chipper as a community can we stream it like what are we talking about here at least Let's get some closure on this fucking shit. Dickheads. So interesting too. I actually was, I was curious because I was, when I was looking at Vitaly or I'm like, does this dude still actually post on YouTube? Cause I mean, like I said, he's got videos that are forever old and he's still like, he still apparently is being the prank bro a little bit. Like he's got videos as recent as a, two, three months ago that are like, Vitaly gives college girls big black surprise, like classic go to college campus and be a dickhead. You. I, just, I walked past by a lot of girls, but I haven't seen anybody like you. And this, nobody deserves this more than you. I appreciate that. That's that's very sweet. I'm going to have to class. She's holding a bag. And she just eats them. And he's live streaming the whole thing too, which I guess is impressive that he's able to do these from a production standpoint. She was not bad at all, bro. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm so sorry I'm late for Can me. I give I this guess to you? that's a new meta. So he's like, interestingly, he's doing what he was doing 10, 15 years ago from the prank standpoint, but now he's adding the live stream element, which is, I guess that's the new thing. I mean, you see it with the Sneakos and the fucking, the neons where it's like, you know, a lot of these guys that were being menaces in public years ago and blowing up on YouTube, you know, uh, as they say, history, I don't know the saying, like history doesn't always repeat itself, but it rhymes, right? Same idea. Now we're kind of going through the same meta. We're just live streaming everything and then, Turning it into YouTube content after that. Uh, but yeah, you know, Vitaly the Goat, back at it. <clears throat> Boy, I mean, what are you going to do? Don't hate the player, hate the game, as they say. Here I am, sat on my ass, mad at the game once again. <laughs> no, but listen, good for him. If he's, I'd rather him be out here <sighs> chucking paint bombs at old pedos than smoking meth doing mushrooms and beating up female joggers so we're we're taking steps in the right direction quite frankly
I mean, if, if the least he could have done is asked the jogger what her her disgust tolerance scale was. <laughs> what the fuck did she call it? The disgust. Well, like how she's doing on the disgust scale. <laughs> oh yeah. Nope. I am disgusted. Please do not come on my face. Um, I think that's all I want to talk about Vitaly or all I want to say about him. I'm pretty much wrapped up in there. The other, th I had this written down on my list. I was like, how, how do you transition? Speaking of, I guess it's kind of all related, right? Like the, uh, the idea of dopamine burnout. And that's, it's kind of cringe to say it's a bit of a meme because I know it's all of these, a lot of, uh, you know, like life hack and uh, productivity channels. Everything's all about dopamine now. I think, you know what? I think it was the Huberman effect. Ever since Huberman blew the fuck up in the last couple of years and he's doing these science-based podcasts that are four hours long and he's just going down the list of like, sleep and circadian rhythm and dopamine and blah, 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 blah. It really became this thing, but there's an element of truth to it. Dopamine burnout and the way it exists in at large in, in the way a lot of our current lifestyles exist where we're just, I guess, constantly being pulled one way or the other. We're not allowing ourselves time to, <clears throat> have our own thoughts. It's always just our phones and our feeds. It's either, if it's not social media, if it's not a feed on an Instagram or Twitter, it's video games, it's pornography. It's all of these very low effort activities that reward our brain with dopamine. And that's, and it's interesting because I've spent a reasonable amount of time listening to and looking into some of the research around it. And, and Huberman does do a decent job talking about it, but I feel like I go through seasons of this kind, you know, of this dopamine burnout, quote unquote, in a sense. And partly that, I think there's also an element of seasonal, what is it called? Seasonal affective disorder, I think is the name for it. It's called SAD. And it's the idea that, you know, if you live in a place with multiple seasons, like I'm from New England, so we have winter, summer, spring, fall, very drastically different. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I always from like, you know, January through April, always the toughest part of the year for me. And I know I'm not alone in that. It's like winter, it sucks, the weather's shitty. And then spring comes around and the weather starts to turn. And it's like, oh my God, all of a sudden, it's like this veil has been lifted, like this weight and you're like, man, what a miserable few months. So there's like that element of seasonal depression, but there's, I think it ties into like the dopamine burnout thing. Like when you are relegated to being inside a lot more because it's cold out, you're not getting, you're not going out and walking or in my case, I'm not going out and golfing or exercising outside. And you're not just taking drives on a beautiful day with the windows down all of all of those opportunities to be outside and enjoying the beauty of nature and all these things are spent inside in on, you know, low effort, high dopamine reward activities like video games, scrolling social media shows, all this shit. And I think like this is such a, a permeating element of our lifestyles now. And we, everyone knows it. I mean, it's being talked about and we kind of take it seriously, but we kind of don't because we just like we understand it. But we're just like, eh. and then it's on to the next video. And like, I'm guilty of this as anybody, but I've, I've over the last couple of years gone through, uh, you know, a few phases where it gets to a point where I'm like, I feel, I can feel myself being like, just completely fucking drained, not in like an energy way, but in like this catatonic, uh, Anhedonic, is that the word? Is that the right word? Anhedonic. Anhedonic. Fuck you. Sorry, I'm looking it up right now because I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Anhedonia is the inability to feel pleasure. Perfect. Fuck yes, I got it right. We're looking it up. Let's fucking go, Leon. Legend. <laughs> it's not that. 
not that impressive, I know. Uh, yeah, anhedonia. It's like the inability to feel pleasure. And this is this is a side effect of all of the, you know, just a, 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 a prolonged period of time in your life where you're just pounding your brain with these low effort dopamine releasing activities and it completely fucks up your baseline so that if you're not constantly just giving yourself these little drips you feel like these withdrawals and i know a lot of you listening to this right now can totally relate and you get it and half of you are like oh fucking shut the fuck up what are you a productivity channel all these things but like the other half are like man yeah like that's I feel that way all the time. Like, is it so is, am I depressed or do, should, do I just need to, to tweak a few things? And, and I don't have an answer, dude, but like, I know that for sure, I'm incredibly interested in experimenting with ways to, uh, you know, mitigate this type of thing. You know, a lot of my adult life has been, um, <clears throat> finding ways to strike balance into the things that I enjoy that I know are not good for me in excess, right? Whether that's alcohol, video games is another huge one for me. Um, there, social media consumption, media consumption, what that looks like. Are you being intentional with what you're consuming? Or are you just being fucking tugged around by your throat, by every algorithm that sits in your pocket? pornography, movies, it, it can be, it can be a lot of different things. I mean, the, the, the ease of consumption now has led to a point where we are, uh, you know, really have to be intentional about what we consume or it just gets out of control. For me this month, I felt myself getting to that point. I was coming off that winter seasonal affective disorder, you know, just those feelings of like, uh, uh, combined with what I what I would classify as like this dopamine burnout where it's like, man, every second it's like it's just hard to sit with yourself. You just wanna you just wanna pull out a phone or I need something to distract myself because woof, the baseline is low right now. And and for me, like that that i you know, everyone has their escapes. Thank God, like it's for it's not drugs or or booze for me. Like I enjoy a little bit of booze, obviously. You guys know me if you watch me or listen to me. I'm drinking some tequila right now. But that's always, for me, been very moderate in a way that it's never, you know, I can I can drink two glasses of tequila during a podcast and then stop and be totally fine, drink some water, have a little protein snack, go to bed. There's some people that once they start, it just, it's you know, they'd stop the podcast and they'd drink another and another and it, it just, it spirals. Uh, booze has never been that for me. I've been very fortunate. Uh, late night, like in a weird way, food is that for me. Food and video games have always been my biggest um, escapes, my biggest spirals. The ones where it's like, if I'm feeling stressed or I am feeling anhedonic. <laughs> uh, it's like, fuck it. I'm just going to go downstairs and pound League of Legends for two hours. And, you know, like half of it is me getting pissed maybe at the game, but at least I'm feeling something, right? And then I'm done with that. And I'm like, the second I leave that, it's like, oh, I have this void again. My dopamine's not being fucking squeezed out of my brain. And so I go up, I'll go upstairs. It's like 2 a.m. I should go to bed, but I don't. I'll just go into the, you know, into the cabinets and fucking grab a bunch of snacks, a bunch of shit, fucking processed vegetable seed oil ridden shit food and just sit down and like pound full pounds of it for no reason. Like I'm not even that hungry. It's just like this, this escape mechanism. That's always been my, that's, that's been my struggle, which is like, it sounds so stupid and trivial, but like everyone has their own thing. I guess I'm blessed in a way because it's not like I'm not struggling with heroin addiction or alcoholism. I'm struggling with playing too many video games and eating a bunch of shit food late at night. So, you know, there's layers. I'm, I'm grateful in a sense that it could be worse. Uh, but yeah, this month I felt it getting a lot of control and, uh, or in the last couple months just with like, putting off things that needed tending to and just, you know, you know, 
running to those escapes a little more often than normal. So I just, uh, as I do, I put my foot down. I was like, all right, we're taking a break. Pull the plug on the video games. Like for me, a lot of times I have to go cold turkey on certain things that I enjoy just to remind myself that like, hey, you can exist without these things. You can be fine. Your time can be spent better. I'm not saying you can't or you shouldn't relax and have things to escape into, but you have to find a way to strike a balance or that shit can spiral so fast and then weeks and months and years go by and what the fuck happened? Where am I? Why am I miserable? <laughs> right? So that's what, that's what a lot of my adult life has been. Uh, for those curious, I don't know. I just, a little bit of an interesting pivot there, but that's that, that, that's shit I think about a lot because you know, it all ties in together. Anxiety, depression, mental health, all these things people talk about now. And it's, you know, it's that are very in the forefront of a lot of conversations clinicians and you know healthy gamer gg is a very popular a guy that you you've probably heard of i can't remember his first name but he's got a big youtube channel and he's on all these big podcasts and he's a clinician and he talks a lot of you know he's a gamer and he talks a lot about you know the the biological mechanisms behind you know why people feel the way they do and all these things and i find that very interesting i don't know a lot of the the science behind it i just know I don't, I don't even know. I try to, I'm constantly trying to understand how it affects my life, how what I do affects my life, how much time I spend doing certain things affects me, where my mood is. It's a roller coaster, but uh, that's it. I think as long as you at least try to be self-aware and pay attention to it and don't just give up on yourself, <coughs> it's a good starting point. A little heartburn, side effect of drinking Añejo on the rocks. What are you going to do? Listen, I asked you guys earlier on my main channel when I was looking into some of this Hollywood Peter Ring shit. I made a community post and a couple of you guys had a couple of really good questions. I just wanted to finish up this episode uh, by answering a few of these. And I'll try not to be too long-winded, but some of these are very good. The first one, <clears throat> um, the first question actually was from uh, uh, Amber, and this was very relevant. She may have heard me say this on a different podcast already, but she asked me, you know, the past few years have been absolutely filled with insanity and degeneracy. And I've seen a lot of people who weren't necessarily religious or atheist come to the conclusion of a higher power, see the value in religious ethics, or just straight up become religious because of it. As someone who was raised Christian but not currently has but does not currently has your view. Oh, as someone who was raised Christian, but not currently. Oh, I guess she's talking about me. She says, has your views changed as well? What do you currently tell your son about God or religion, if anything? That is a great question because I guess she has heard me talk about this before. I was raised religious. Um, and just as I matured into an adult, became a little bit more agnostic and less thrilled with uh, organized religion in general. And, you know, agnosticism is not atheism in the sense that it's not like there is no God. It's more like, ah, I don't really, I can't prove you, you know, you can't prove that there is one and I can't prove that there's not. So I just kind of like, it's a little bit of a waffle in the middle. It's like, I'd love to think that there is, but I just have so many qualms with a lot of institutionalized religion that it's really hard for me to get behind a lot of it. But I think when you abstract a lot of the theology and a lot of the bullshit that's written in these books, I'm not super opposed to this idea of like having a relationship with a higher power, or at least a belief in something like that. I think for me, it really just comes down to faith and belief, right? I think there is merit in having faith and belief in something that is beyond and bigger than yourself. I think there's not a lot to be gained by just thinking that like, you know, I am the God of my own life and I control everything. And, you know, there, there, it's, it's one thing to feel in control and in power, but I think there, whether or not, you know, what you believe is objectively true and I don't think that ev anyone will ever be able to prove that. I mean, that is like the, literally the, as long as humanity has been 
in existence. It's that's what is the core of religion is like trying to be like, hey, we understand why we're here, what our purpose is, and what our afterlife holds for us. And while you can't prove that, that can be a powerful motivator for good or bad, right? So there's certainly value in it, depending on depending on what you're trying to what you're trying to accomplish, I guess. But to answer her question, yeah, I I, I don't know, man. You know. I think it's interesting, this idea that, you know, the past few years have been absolutely filled with insanity and degeneracy, she says. And my my response to that is like, man, we have such narrow goggles on. <laughs> I'm like, the, wor- the world is not as bad as you think it is, man. We spent, we're terminally online. We spend too much online just consuming all the worst shit. But if you think like... Out of all of the centuries and millenniums to be alive, like we're, it's not that bad. Like, yeah, shit's crazy and there's division and people are, uh, everywhere you look online, it's like people are mad at each other and we're protesting this. And there, yes, there's wars and all this stuff, but this is shit that's as tale as old as time. This is old as humanity. Humanity was built on conquering bloodshed disaster, like that it, it is innate to humanity. All of these things we're seeing and a lot of the stuff we're seeing now was far worse <laughs> a long time ago for a long time. So, so, well, yes, I, I think I'm not, you know, in comparison, I don't know. I don't think all of a sudden it's like, wow, the world is so much worse than it was two decades ago. I think, you know, I think if we were living two decades ago, we would be thinking the same thing. I think no matter what era you live in, you're always thinking, oh, man, the world's gone to shit. Because we have rose-colored goggles, man. That's what we do. We always look back at prior generations and think, oh, things were so great back then. And certainly there were elements of those times that were good. But we have uh, – a, there's a human bias that is very good at forgetting a lot of the stresses and the terrible emotions you were you were, you know, snuggled up to in that time. And you remember the a lot of the beauty – Aside from obvious, you know, traumatic events, maybe. But anyways, she did ask me as well, like, what do you currently tell your son about God or religion, if anything? That That's a great question because uh, he he's at an age where those questions do come up. And I, we do talk about that a little bit. And I'm not, I don't have a completely clear plan on it, but I don't see, I don't see the benefit in trying to be like, I don't think, you know, there is, there is no God, all these things like, well, this, that, you know, and I come from a family where the, that conversation comes up and I know he's, he's heard from his Mimi, uh, about, uh, Jesus and God and these things. So it's a little bit touch and go. We're playing it out and I'm not, I'm kind of on, I'm on board with it. I, we, you know, we don't go to church and these things, but I'm more, I'm more concerned with teaching him the values and in instilling in him the moral foundation that I think is most important to being a man of character. And a lot of those things full, full stop came from my religious background. You know, a lot of these fruits of the spirit as they might call them that I find so important, um, came from the religious background. So I'm finding ways to instill those in him just through my actions and my example without it having to be like, well, you have to act this way or you're going to hell. Like, I'm not super pumped about that. But yeah, we can have a little conversations about God and where we came from. And it's fun, man. It's, it's, it's Raising a kid is a beautiful thing. You know, there's so many, so many variables and different ways to do it. It's like, you always hope you're doing your best. I think I'm doing all right. I'm having the time of my life, though. I'll tell you that. It's the best. Uh, Thank you for that question. Uh, Michelle the Destroyer says, why don't you stream on Twitch anymore? Milf Manor season two would be good to catch up on. Listen, I'm in the process of bringing back some streaming. I'm thinking I might do it on YouTube. Milf Manor season two would be uh, a disaster. I don't don't know if I have the emotional fortitude to sit through another season of that absolute travesty, but there's going to be some streams coming up in the future, I think, probably on the YouTube channel. 
I wouldn't mind doing some live body cam stuff. I think that could be really fun. Uh, but I've I've gotten the itch. Not going to be video games. I think like the video game streaming thing for me is is sailed. I like video games. If I'm going to play them, it's going to be with my friends. It's going to be off camera. But I think doing some some just chatting non VG stuff absolutely. Uh, Papa Dave says I'm 65. Don't have much to laugh about lately with the way the country is circling the toilet. Your commentary cracks me up. Keep it up. My response to that is kind of the same. Like you know what, Dave, I. I hear you. It feels that way. And certainly we have our issues as a country. I don't disagree, but there's so much beauty and so many things to be thankful for as an American. And politically, yes, I do think it's a disaster, but I think sometimes we just need to, you know, how much does this stuff actually affect our lives? If you shut off the news, if you shut your phone off and you turn the radio off, you put down the newspaper right? All this shit that's trying to make money off your attention. How much does this, how much does this shit that's going on actually negatively affect your life? Okay. We can talk about the taxes, all these things. Certainly there's going to be things, but all I'm, all I'm trying to say is there's so many things to be thankful for and so much beauty and so many wonderful fucking people that live in this country that live in this world that just never find their way on the internet or into your news articles or your radio stations because they're just good people. And those aren't the type of people that make headlines. So we cannot forget that those people exist and that we can be those people too, right? That's important. We're just, I feel like our viewpoint of the world is so skewed because of the way content is engineered to elicit emotional responses from us to make people money. Just got to remember that. What's my favorite liquor and why? I answered that earlier as I'm drinking tequila. Longtime fan. I also lost, watched Lush Life with my wife, Christelle. And fun fact, our sons are the exact same age, small world. My question is, what kind of hours do you log in your studio? Is it a nine to five kind of thing for you? And has observing memes and internet culture as a job affected the way you enjoy internet and entertainment as a whole? That's uh, a great question. Uh, I have, there's no rhyme or reason. It is currently 1.53 in the morning right now as I'm recording this. Terrible, fucking awful. And then half of the week, I'll be trying to be really good and going to bed before midnight to get up. It's I, one thing I've really struggled with as a YouTuber and P, someone who, you know, makes content for the internet. And ha I have the, the good, the, the luxury and the blessing of being able to make my own schedule in a lot of ways. Uh, having a consistent schedule has always been a difficulty. And I think that's very ubiquitous among a lot of YouTubers or creative people in a sense. It's, it's tough for them to lock into that rigidity. So I would love to be able to clock in, clock out in a sense, it, but it, it is tough to leave, you know, work at home, quote unquote. And uh, there are times where it's just a complete shit show. I'll be up till 2 a.m., some days, other days I'm in bed at 10, getting up at 7 a.m. It's, uh, it is what it is, but I've made it work. Um, and yeah, I would say, you know, being in the internet culture, I don't know if it's really it changed the way I enjoy things. It probably, I'm sure that it has, certainly. I know my attention span has suffered, but I think that's not just because of, I do this as a job. I think that's just uh, humanity at large, our culture at large, because of the way entertainment and content is transitioned. But, um, uh, I definitely probably, I probably watch less YouTube than a normal person that isn't doing it just because I consume so much of it in a way that's not for enjoyment. It's more for like research or looking for things to talk about. Oh, so actually this one's from Allie and this is a good question and a good, I think a good one to end on because she asked me what's next for the pod and what is your vision slash hope? Um, excellent question because I've had, I think what, one of the issues I've struggled with in my time on the internet is identity in a lot of ways. I think I've been able to lean into things that I'm good at after a lot of iterations and trying things that I'm not necessarily good at. I've just, I've experienced and experimented with a lot of things, different kind of content um, before I was even doing more talking head stuff. Um, and with the podcast, uh, similar problem where I don't, you know, it's one, 
I feel like a lot of people have it niche down. They're like, hey, I'm a fitness guy. My channel's about fitness. I make videos about how to get six packs and here's my macros and nutrition and my podcast is about fitness. And it's like, it's easy in the way that like people know exactly what they're going to get when they come to you. Right. But on the flip side, you're also kind of captured by that audience where if you, you can't, you're not really making anything non-fitness related or nutrition related because that's not what people expect. So there's a, it's a difficult, there can be difficulty in that in trying to do something more general or more like, hey, this is the Decently Indecent podcast where we talk about X, Y, Z. Trying to figure that out. I have a few inspirations, though, which we'll talk about. I mean, I listen to a lot of different podcasts over the years. Obviously, you have there's ones like Modern Wisdom from Chris Williamson, um, Diary of a CEO, George Janko, the style of podcast that is like the singular host, and it's more these kind of like in-depth, philosophical, um, insightful conversations, not really comedy-based, more like, hey, we're trying to talk about life and figure out humanity, right? And I get, I've get i I've gotten a lot of value out of those. So I think there was an element of that, that that lived in me as I was starting something longer form that wanted to bring that to the table. And I think you'll see that in some of the earlier episodes where it's... Uh, you know, just me talking to some of my friends and a one-on-one setting a little more in depth than maybe you might see them elsewhere. And I love that, but I also don't want to ignore the part of me that, uh, you know, is just a little bit of a fucking, is a little tapped, right? That you might see in a Leon Lush video on the main channel. Uh, and then you have other shows like the H3 podcast or Jeff, F- Jeff FM, where it's like um, a full production team and they're more, high volume. They're talking about internet culture, things that are topical. It's very meme heavy. It's joke oriented. And I like that stuff a lot as well, but that's obviously, I just, I'm not at a point where I have a team to execute something of that nature. Um, but this is the thing, you, I, you know, I think for a lot, for a lot of things and just content in general, it's like you need, or at least for me in particular, uh, I've always done best when I started, you know, I have a loose concept of what I want to do and I have an idea of what I can bring to the table and I start and then I really start to chisel and whittle as I go. I think, you know, some people really want to have this finished product and this full package before they launch. And that I think that maybe that's beneficial and it probably works for some people. Um, I've just always been a little bit of a build as I go kind of guy. Um, so then the, the other obviously uh, inspiration and in just guys I looked up to or guys I look up to who you, you obviously know, uh, excuse me, I shouldn't assume if you've watched some of these episodes uh, is the unsubscribe podcast guys. Uh, my friends from Texas, like Eli and Donut and, and Brandon Herrera, those guys, that's the more multiple hosts all in the same room together, bringing in outside guests uh, having fun, boisterous, obviously talking about some serious stuff, some dark stuff, but a lot of comedic elements to it, having a great time. Love that. Uh, would love to get to a place where I can have a show in the Boston area where I live, where I'm bringing on people, whether they're flying in or have some local guests. Maybe I have a, a particular, a dedicated studio. So I'm obviously not like flying people into my house where my studio is now. Uh, And being able to do something like that. So that, those are the three, those are the three inspirations that I have in just trying to figure out what the best, uh, I would say what the best model is for me. I mean, as typically when I do things, I, I try my best to take elements that I love from other people's content that I love and find a way to implement that in a way that is organic to what suits me and my audience. So that's where I'm at. That's my vision. I want to grow it. I, I, I don't, the idea of having a, a co-host or co-host is not off the table. I don't know what that looks like, but I think the the one thing that I really want to eventually grow into is having more in-person, same room interactions in whatever capacity that is, whether it's with a consistent co-host or bringing guests in. I just, as much as I love doing remote the remote podcast, similar to like 
the Some Ordinary podcast or just the episodes I've done already and talking to people. And I find a lot of value in those. There just is an energy that cannot be replicated when you're, you know, communicating through a screen. So that's my vision. That's my hope. I also love um, doing episodes like this where I just get to sit down and just kind of mask off, really be myself, talk about some stuff that's going on and be in a place where I'm fortunate enough that there's a handful of you guys that listen to me. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for coming to episode 10 of the Decently Indecent podcast. Uh, be sure to leave a comment, like, like on Spotify and Apple Music if you can. It means the world to me. And I will see you guys in the next episode. I appreciate you. Peace.